talking about are um, a little kind of down to the hard basics of <laughs> good and evil and sin and faithfulness and all that thing, all those things. You know, it's not popular to preach about sin. It just isn't. No one, either people don't want to hear it or they're so convinced it doesn't apply to them. <laughs> but I can assure you, people just don't like it. And, and, and if you are a preacher that talks about sin, you're reminded quite often of how, oh, but Jesus was all about love and grace. Where's the love and the grace? Well, the love and the grace was on the cross. And the price for our sin was death. And it's important for us to remember that we are also responsible for what happened at Calvary because none of us is without sin. So I don't like talking about it. I don't like beating people over the head about it any more than I like people beating me over the head about it. But the reason I... And talking about it often in the sermon series is because I think we get desensitized to it. And I think we can't ignore sin if we truly are going to be serious about being the holy people that God calls us to be. So speaking about sin from my perspective is more about learning what God calls holy and how we're supposed to live as holy. I'm not trying to stay in the mud. I'm just trying to remind us all that we are in this process of refinement. And we've got to get into the place where we recognize it, even those little sins of attitude and things like that. We are not perfect. But the easier we recognize those things, the quicker we are to confess and repent. So that's my disclaimer. <laughs> because I'm going to talk about it a little bit again today. <laughs> and we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Colossians 3, 1 through 15. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self, <clears throat> with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body 
You were called to peace and be thankful. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. <clears throat> a few years ago, my niece, who lives in California, was telling me about a situation she found herself in where someone was cutting her down and, and acting like they were teasing about it. You ever had somebody do that? They say these rude little snippy comments, and oh, I'm just kidding, you're so sensitive, you know? I mean, just kind of berating them and trying to get away with it. They had a very hateful attitude, and the situation was beginning to escalate. Tempers were flaring, and a confrontation was building up. And she, as she was describing this situation to me in our phone conversation, she said, Tia, which is aunt in Spanish, <laughs> she said, Tia, I had to check myself. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know, I mean, I knew she was uh, really passionate about telling me all of this, and, and what she meant was that everything within her wanted to tear into that person and let them have it. But she restrained herself, and she took the high road instead. Now, believe me when I say that little Latina can hold her own. <laughs> she has seven children. I can tell you that she knows how to lay it down. <laughs> and I'm so proud of her for exercising that self-control and, and instead of spending a lot of unnecessary negative energy in a verbal showdown that would have gotten no one anywhere. <clears throat> We all need to check ourselves before doing or saying things we know are going to lead us into bad situations, verbally, emotionally, physically, even spiritually. Places that would be completely avoidable if we would simply stop and check ourselves, get our wits about us. Remember who we are called to be, as our scripture says, God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. They tell parents to count to 10 before disciplining them, so they avoid disciplining them out of unnecessary anger. It would do us good as Christians to have a 10 second rule, to stop and check ourselves, say a silent prayer before responding to difficult situations and temptations. My niece chose to take the high road. She took authority over her emotions and a lot of that was um, because she was not gonna give the other person the satisfaction of manipulating her into an argument. <laughs> that was clear. And that's a good reason. <laughs> I mean, it's as good as any. But she made a choice at a critical moment. Instead of just engaging, she pulled back. And she's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you don't get to take me here. You don't get to take me here. In my Lenten series, Dare to Be a Disciple, I've shared the following messages. Sin, call it what it is. Just say no. Covenant people. And today my message is titled, Choosing Faithfulness. Because being faithful is a choice. Every day, every moment. Our scripture this morning reminds us that God loves us and he has chosen us when we accept Christ as our, well he loves us even if we don't accept Christ as, his savior, as our Savior, right? But he has chosen us to be his holy people. And by being his sons and daughters, we are called to live into that identity. I think we can all relate to that from a parent, most of us, from a parental level, can't we? Yeah. When it comes to our children, we have certain expectations, you know? Um, now, some parents 
granted, they're extreme and they're, you know, put a lot of pressure on them to do this or do that or whatever. But I mean, just at the, at the very basic level, as a parent, you want your child to at least be identifiably your child, right? You know, I mean, you don't want them to go off and just crazy land where they're just making horrible decisions that take them all down the, you know, you want them to understand who they are as an individual, as your son or daughter. And I won't even get into family culture as I could, it would apply, but I mean, you want people to know when they meet your child and hopefully <laughs> They're respectful and, you know, mindful of other people and things like that. And then when they find out your child, they're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, they're, they're the same, from the same cloth. Now, we all know that's not perfect. <laughs> we all know that that is not how it always happens. But that is our desire, isn't it? And such it is with our Heavenly Father. He wants when people encounter us for, for us to be identifiably his. It's easy to be in the workplace and for people not to have a clue that you do belong to God. I was that person. I think I shared that with you several weeks ago. One of my friends said, well, I didn't know you were a Christian. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so ashamed. Of course you don't. Of course you don't. I don't act any different than anyone else. So we need to embrace our identity and understand that, that although God is forgiving and we're covered in grace and he loves us no matter how imperfectly we walk out our faith, his desire is for us to get it right. His desire is for us to be holy. And it's for our benefit. It's for his benefit too because that advances the kingdom of God. But it requires faithfulness. When we are inclined to cave and give in to temptation, a temptation will look so different for each one of us. We all have those different things that draw us. But when we're inclined to cave, we need to check ourselves. We need to remember our covenant and who God calls us to be. We need to choose faithfulness and not sinfulness because the choice is always before us. I wish I could tell you I've always responded to others with love and grace when they have aggravated or insulted me or offended me, <laughs> but I can't. I, like everyone else, have certainly let my anger, my hurt feelings, my insecurities get the best of me. It doesn't happen often, but it's happened. And I've learned over the years that the closer I draw to Christ, the more I fill my life, my heart, my thoughts with him and his word, the better I am at maintaining that even disposition. The better I am at responding with a Christ-like attitude. Now, I don't walk it out perfectly, but I am so mindful of it in such a way that I didn't used to be. And I'm sure trying. John Wesley believed that formally renewing our covenant and commitment to God must include a pledge to choose faithfulness on a regular basis. That means keeping our hearts and minds pure, centered on heavenly things, not the earthly things, as our text this morning reminds us. Wesley's advice, and I love this, you know, um, people kind of get this romantic view of John Wesley if you've been a Methodist most of your life, but let me tell you, he was hardcore, fire and brimstone. He did not candy coat anything, and I'm sorry, 
I like that about him. Because <laughs> I just think we get too many people tiptoeing around everybody's feelings when it comes to the word of God. But he said, resolve in God's strength to never go back. Meaning, never go back to our sinful attitudes and our sinful ways. Jesus taught this every time he said, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go and try harder next time. He didn't say, go and just try not to let it happen as many times. He was, it was black and white. People don't like black and white anymore. They don't like absolutes. They, it, truth has to be absolute. It's not truth if it's not absolute. And the truth of God's word is that Jesus said, go and sin no more. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty hard line. That seems like an easy enough promise to keep, doesn't it? But clearly it isn't easy, because <laughs> here we are. We live in a world that's filled with so many things that the enemy will use as devices to distract us and get us off course, like our old temptations. You know, he'll pull something out of the closet that we thought we'd been done with for years. And then all of a sudden, bam, there it is. And we can't even believe we would consider doing that again. Oh, and there's the new ones that we've never even thought about before. And there's social media. And the internet. I wish it were illegal for children to be on the internet. I mean, I think you should be 30 before you have a kind of responsibility. I mean, seriously, it's, it's awful what kids can pull up on their phones. I bet you do know that in your profession. <clears> that we have the compromising situations we put our, or, well, we may put ourselves in there, but sometimes we just find ourselves in those situations. And then there's those alluring people and it's not always alluring in a, in a way that would lead us to sexual immorality. It could be alluring in a lot of different ways. It could be with drugs. There's those alluring people, and we like them so much, yeah. that what they're peddling surely can't be that bad because they're just so likable. All these things, they muddy the waters and they blur the lines that once were so well defined. And we can't think because we're beyond our childbearing years and all our kids are grown, we got grandkids, we can't think like, well, I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's a lie. You know, it makes me think of a leaky faucet. You know, sometimes sin can creep into our lives, and it's like you hear a little drip, drip, drip. <laughs> you hear it in the background, you're like, huh, must be a leaky faucet somewhere. But you kind of tune it out. Because, I mean, who's worried about their house flooding from a tiny little leaky faucet, faucet, right? And then before you know it, you wake up, and all of a sudden, the carpet's all sloshy. Because <laughs> that leaky faucet wasn't attended to. And now there's clearly water on the floor. You put on your rain boots, and you're like, oh, man, I don't have time to call the plumber, and that's going to be costly, and all that other stuff. I'll just start tinkering with it myself. And then you just kind of get used to it. And you just live in that house with sloshy carpet, wearing your rain boots around. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just, it's the things that we become comfortable with and okay with. Because we just don't really want to look at the problem because it's a hassle. Or we just don't want to fix it. 
But before we know it, we get up and all of a sudden we're waist deep, we're neck deep. And it all started from that tiny, tiny little drip that we tuned out. We become desensitized to it. It's just like it's a part of the environment all of a sudden. That's how it is with sin. It's like that tiny little pet. And it might just be a sin of attitude. You know what plagues Christians more than anything? And any Barna survey would tell you this. Any preacher would tell you this. The biggest sin that makes its way into the hearts and lives of born-again believers is unforgiveness. For most of it, it's not going to, most of us, it's not going to be those big gasp things, you know, like infidelity or pornography and things, although that's a big one in the body of Christ, I'll tell you that. But, unforgiveness. And you know, it, it comes in and we think, well, it's justified. They don't deserve to be. Look what they did to me. They never even apologized. They don't even acknowledge they did anything that needs forgiving. And it just gets a hold of us. And we just let it stay there. And then we grow more bitter, bitter and resentful. And relationships are destroyed. Witnesses are destroyed. creeps in. So it's necessary to check ourselves. To check the plumbing every now and then and make sure there aren't any leaky faucets, if you know what I mean. We need to recalibrate our minds and our hearts and our lives to heaven where Christ is. That's setting our mind on things above. Listen, I've been in situations with people that were so like porcupines and you couldn't even Christians in the workplace that were so like porcupines that I was, if I even got near them, I'd be like, kee, 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 all these little quills because of the tension between us. And I had to pray myself to work. It was a 15-minute drive. And I had to pray myself to work every day and say, Lord, I do not like that person. I felt like, you know, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them in my hand. I mean, I would go to work and have to pray myself and say, Lord, I don't like them. But you've got to help me love them. I know you love them. I know they are the apple of your eye. I don't see it. <laughs> so help me see them the way you see them. Because all I can see in front of me is how mean they are. And how unreasonable they are. And let me tell you, before I really got a hold of that situation, if you think that didn't grow into a, from a, a molehill to a mountain and my husband's hearing me coming home every day, you'll never leave. You know, I'm just like, and he called himself Christian. You know, I mean, it was just, it totally just put this negativity in our household even, in the atmosphere, because I wasn't checking myself. I just, I just engaged and I let him manipulate me in to all that negativity. So it can creep in uninvited. <laughs> and it may not be, like I said, those huge gasping things like, oh, they did what? It's more likely going to be those things that if you share that to somebody who's close to you, they might even say, man, I don't blame you a bit. I feel the same way. You poor thing. <laughs> and we do need to console one another. But man, what we need is for people to pray with us. Yeah. We need friends like that, amen? Friends that will say, let's just talk to God about this right now. Let's just pray for peace. And if there can't be reconciliation, let there at least be peace. We need to realign our ways to God's ways. We need to re-snap. That's what Lent is about. But we should do this 
much more often than once a year, but re-snapping that heavenly plumb line to make sure the path that we are on is headed in the right direction. Because even if it starts getting off just a little bit, it's going to end off way over here. Oh, we'll still get to heaven, but we're going to miss a lot of blessings. And we're going to miss a lot of opportunities to be that witness for God, for others. It's like a preventative maintenance. You know, it, it goes a long way. My uh, husband, as most of you know, even though he's not working in this profession actively, he is a Harley Davidson technician. And he will be one of the first to tell you that it's absolutely necessary to have a regular maintenance schedule of your vehicle. It goes a long way in preventing costly repairs and, and, and repairs that, could, that are generally happening because of neglect. Preventative maintenance means taking care of the things you know need to be addressed on occasion, like the leaky faucet. It means taking a good look under the hood. That's what Lent is. Checking the oil. <laughs> it's checking to see that everything really is the way that it should be because even the most sound vehicle that is running smoothly and had all the fluids checked like it should and everything, even that vehicle, after miles and miles of travel, needs to be realigned. And that's what our scripture is about this morning. Reminding us of some of those ugly things that are in that scripture. I mean, when you when you read all the licentious references there, you're just like, Ugh. you know, I mean, do I really need to hear that on Sunday morning? But maybe, maybe we do. Take a look under the hood. Since we've been raised with Christ, we set our hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, setting our mind on things above, not earthly things. Paul tells us, to put to death, that's strong language, put to death the things that once belonged to our earthly nature. Tom and I have a close friend that went through a real tumultuous uh, relationship that was the result of infidelity several years ago. And she took all those belongings and all the photos and she went out into their city street and lit a bonfire. <laughs> and I know it was, it was, it was um, cathartic to her. I think that might be the wrong word. But anyway, it, it, it helped her have some closure apparently. But she put those things to death. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it was her turning point where she was like, it is over, I'm moving on, I will not be in this toxic situation anymore. And that's when we put things to death, as Paul was talking about us, maybe we need to have a little bonfire and say no more. I'm not going to go there again. I refuse to walk in those old shoes, to put on those old rags, in fact, I'm just going to burn them up in the city street so I can't even put them back on if I want to. <clears throat> we put to death those things that once belonged to our earthly nature. And if there's any question about what those things might be, well, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He is our convictor who convicts us not out of condemnation but out of love. Out of love. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, it's not easy for us as your children to hear that 
we still have a long way to go to be your holy sons and daughters. But we trust you, Father. We love you. And we thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for all of our failures, for all of our sins, for every, every time we have just missed the mark. That's what you took to the cross so willingly. And we thank you. We didn't deserve it. But you did it anyway. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our best friend. That you are always so mindful of what is best for us and best for the kingdom. And, and when you are that voice in us and, and that unction in us to try to keep us from doing something or to get us to do something, help us to be quicker to respond in obedience. Help us to be receptive. Help us to see it, not as this negative thing, but as, out of this loving guidance that you know how much more blessed we will be if we'll just get it right. Help us, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.